uh, assessment of how we're all doing, I'm going to put a simple equation on the screen. And if you could just raise your hand when you have an answer in your head, either approximate or precise. See some hands coming up. A little slower. OK, there they are. There they are. Cool, cool. Very good. Uh, there's, there's some context behind this, this uh, equation, uh, this calculation uh, I'll share with you, because this was incredibly important to me at one time. 6,000 was our elevation above sea level. 1,000 was the elevation of the featureless abyss below. 800 was our descent rate in feet per minute. We were engineless in a single engine plane at night over the frigid January skies of Arkansas. Our engine had just quit. The answer to this equation that I just posted on the slide was the amount of time that we would have until impact. So I have some graphs. They're, they're not, they weren't collected in real time, but I, I did plot them after the fact. We have engine RPM, which dropped precipitously from about 2,500 down to zero. And if we overlay a correlated event, my heart rate, <laughs> It goes from resting, you know, alert but normal to just beating furiously out of my chest. When, when I heard that, that sound drop, that perfectly tuned humming along engine drop down to nothing, down to idle and then nothing, my mind had said, this is an urgent threat. And it invoked a physiological call to arms. It was only after I was doused in adrenaline and visibly shaking and short of breath that the pilot in command next to me had said, can you please figure out how much time we have left until we are going to be on the ground? My name is Tommy Lutz, and I'm here talking about mindfulness, the practice of being aware of one's mind, one's body, and one's surroundings, what it is, and how we can apply it. I've been in the tech industry for about 15 years. I am a private pilot. I can fly single engine aircraft, uh, gliders and hang gliders on a good day. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a manager at Google. I've been at Google for about two years. And the primary inspiration for this talk is the Search Inside Yourself program and that adventurous flight I had with my brother two years ago. So we can start off by talking about threats. What I experienced in the cockpit of that aircraft was a threat. We have physical threats and threats to our ego. A physical threat, somebody chasing me with a baseball bat, right? It would be really great if I could run really fast or I could fight that person off. Threat to my ego, very different. This could be the threat of being embarrassed or ridiculed or ignored, having your work put down by somebody else. If we were to write some C++ code that just elaborated on how humans process threats. We could say, if the threat is likely to cause harm, we're gonna boost the energy, we're gonna dump some adrenaline into that person because they probably need the energy, and we're gonna get ready to fight. We're gonna take all that blood that's in the brain, we're gonna move it down to the major muscle groups so that they can run and they can fight. But, you know, this is just, it's legacy code. And it really doesn't take into account the, the two different types of threats. So if we bring this into the room right now, I, I'm standing in front of you right now, and I can tell you I don't feel my normal 100% intelligent self. I can tell that my heart rate is elevated. I can feel it beating. I can tell that my breath is shorter than usual. You may be able to detect some quivering in my voice, some stumbling over words. Uh, there's, no, there's nobody chasing me off the stage with a baseball bat yet. <laughs> Haven't gotten to that slide. But clearly, this is a threat, right? This is a threat to my ego. I could do something up here that's embarrassing. Oh, uh, that second one is for the Java folks in the room. <laughs> I, I wanted to be inclusive here. <clears throat> so our, our minds are constantly assessing threats, and they're constantly making decisions and expressing preferences. Some of these things can be very helpful, like picking out what you want in the buffet line, right? You don't want to 
do a trade analysis on whether you're going to take the potatoes or the chicken. These micro decisions are automatic, low latency, really efficient, but not always appropriate in the context of high stakes decisions like should I hire this person or not or how should I greet this person that just came in. We're constantly taking in our physical state, all the things that we're sensing in around us, and probably most importantly, all of the habit, habit patterns and prejudgments that we've experienced through our entire lives, they're shaping the reactions that we come up with. And what usually happens is things like facial expressions will change automatically. We'll call somebody a jerk, we'll call their work inappropriate or just no good before we even have a chance to think about what the impact of doing those things would be. These are the types of reactions that I think it's really important that we build the ability to control, the ability to monitor, and that's really what mindfulness is about in this context, is gaining awareness of this process. <clears throat> so we can describe four phases of cultivating mindfulness. The first phase would be where your mindfulness is relatively low and you find yourself reacting defensively and judgmentally. You see people and you make judgments and assumptions based on what they look like. You're uh, taking any criticisms directed towards you as a personal attack. Eventually you realize maybe this isn't the way I should be acting, right? I'm not receiving positive feedback. I don't have any, uh, I'm not making any friends this way. And so you start to rehearse and pre-plan some of your responses. When somebody cuts me off in traffic, that usually upsets me. So I've pre-programmed a response for myself, I've rehearsed it. I imagine that person really has to go to the bathroom and I'm gonna let them in. It helps a lot. And of course, we're in the SRE ecosystem here. So when things don't go well, and they, there, there will always be cases where they don't go well, where we do things that we regret, we can write post-mortems, if not on paper, then in our head, about what the factors were that went into that decision into that action. Lastly, we can bring that retrospective into the real time and we can intercept and modify that process. So we can make more conscious, actionable decisions that are more aligned with our personal values as opposed to ones that we are going to regret later on. Who likes the code in Python here? Anybody? A couple of hands, cool. Who doesn't like the code in Python here? A couple of hands, cool. Uh, I like to code in Python because of duck typing. If it can be misconstrued as a duck, it's a duck. So <laughs> <clears throat> if we have a, a function here that describes how humans react, uh, we're going to assess the threat of a given stimulus and we're going to prejudge it and then just return it, right? This is just the way people, people are working in this simple model. We can wrap it in a decorator, which it took me like three weeks to figure out how decorators worked. <clears throat> But don't worry, you get to see one yourself. Here's the decorator. So we're calling the original reaction function, but before we return our assessment of the threat and our prejudgment, we apply an attitude of kindness and of curiosity. And with those two things in mind, we can observe our biases and give ourselves a chance to correct for those things. It can be really difficult to do this on a regular and consistent basis, but once you learn how to do this, it's incredibly powerful. And I am so sorry for all these terrible analogies. Here's a straightforward definition of mindfulness. It is paying attention to one's mind, one's body, and one's surroundings. And in doing so, realizing that we are automatically going to make judgments about these three things when we observe them. In order to counter those judgments, in order to avoid the self-blame, we apply an attitude of curiosity and kindness. And that's why those last two elements are so critical to mindfulness. When can you use this? How about incident management? You're sitting at your desk or at, at your computer at home or whatever, and then all of a sudden the alerts start coming in. Your colleagues start calling you, pinging you. Customers are complaining, tweets are flying, your service is down, right? You can't ping your critical servers, whatever it happens to be. All these things, if you're responsible for fixing all of these things, that can definitely evoke this ego threat. This, this reaction that the body has. And it's really important that you just, just stop. Just take a breath. There's always time for a breath. You can observe what's going on in your own mind. What are you telling yourself about what's going on? You can observe what your colleagues are doing. 
what people are saying, what the systems are doing. You can decide what you're going to do next, and then you can act. And if you didn't do the right thing, at least you can go back and say, I was really thoughtful and mindful about what I did. I, had, I took in all the set of information I needed to take in to try and achieve the best outcome possible. Another aspect that one of the other speakers, I think it was Jonathan, talked about in the code review culture talk, if any of you went to that, defensiveness. Let's say you have an idea, which we all have ideas, <clears throat> and because we work with such thoughtful and smart colleagues, they are very quick to point out all the ways in which that idea is not going to work. I think we've probably all experienced this at some point. And that is easily converted from a critique on one's work to a threat to one's ego, which again brings about this defensive nature. And so a typical reaction would be, oh, clearly I haven't told you all the ways in which my idea is perfect. Let me tell you again. And uh, this usually doesn't work out too well. Uh, it just involves heated debate where people start talking through each other instead of with each other. Using mindfulness, you can start to become aware of when you see yourself doing this. That can help bring the conversation back to an area where mutual purpose is identified and you can identify what people's true concerns and values are. And you may not come to agreement, but at least everyone will feel understood. If you're on the other side of this conversation and you are critiquing another colleague's work, this gives you a unique opportunity situated with the group to identify when things are escalating emotionally and bring the conversation back to a psychologically safe place. To tell people, to remind people that we're talking about the idea itself and not the qualities of the individual and to help kind of calm the situation. Mindfulness will allow you to observe these things. It gets even more complicated when we introduce power dynamics. So who was it that actually threatened your ego during this, this session? Was it your director? Was it your, your peer or a direct report? Uh, it matters because people react differently when their boss says something compared to when their peer says something. And if you look around the room, what do the folks in the room actually look like? And it's not, are you labeling people? It's how are you labeling people? Because again, the mind is incredibly good at developing patterns and saying, oh, I've seen this before, I know what this looks like. Unfortunately, what this means is all of the stereotypes that we have baked into our minds, and we all have them, come out in our actions, whether we like it or not. If you are mindful about what is going on and what the people in the room look like, you'll be more likely to counter these biases. How can you actually do this? The good news is you can train yourself, you can cultivate this mindfulness with some very simple exercises. They don't need to be charged or paired or connected to Wi-Fi. <clears throat> it, it all starts with focusing on the sensation of breathing. After you focus on the sensation of breathing, your mind will eventually wander. Sometimes after five breaths, three breaths, two breaths, doesn't matter. Why don't we just give that a shot right now? Just put down your phones and just, just take a, a nice deep breath in through your nose. Ready? Deep breath in. And slow breath out. One more. Deep breath in through the nose. And slow breath out. We can keep doing this. That felt really good. Did anybody else think that felt good? Yeah. Uh, we can keep doing this and observing the breath. And eventually the mind will wander. And it's incredibly important that once we notice the mind has wa wandered, we just apply that kindness and that curiosity. And we just gently bring that attention back to the, the sensation of, of breathing. And you can observe the temperature of the air, just anything else that you can sense. Once you get comfortable doing this, you can shift your attention from focusing on the breath to say focusing on the mind. What kind of stories is your mind telling you? Again, without judgment, without judging what your, your inner voice is actually saying. It's normal for the mind to explore problems. And lastly, you can also do this with your surroundings as well. In SRE, we bring so much more value than just engineering reliability into our products and services that we support. 
And we oftentimes focus on how can we influence the devs? How can we influence the product managers? How can we influence other things about it? We don't realize the one thing we can always influence is ourselves. The one thing that we always can make a positive change in is ourselves. And we can do that by starting with the breath. The next time you find yourself in your own engineless airplane, cruising down in the night skies, be prepared by knowing more about yourself and being able to truly observe your mind, your body, and your surroundings. You'll find yourself rolling gently to a stop on that runway, and you'll have used way less luck than we had to use that night. Thank you.